Yeah, please start. Thank you. Greetings of the day, everyone. I'm privileged to welcome you all in the third edition of Foreign City Literature Fest, organized by SGR Knowledge Foundation in association with GH Ryerson University, powered by Ryerson Group of Institutions. I am Priyanka Sharma, and I'm delighted to be your anchor for today's session, Hickey's Bengal Gazette, the untold story of India's first newspaper by Mr. Andrew Otis. It's a delight to have Mr. Andrew Otis with us, who's the author the untold story of India's first newspaper. He has completed his PhD in journalism from the University of Maryland in November 2021. He was a Fulbright Fellow to Kolkata in 2013 and 14, and he now lives in Washington, D.C. And it's an absolute pleasure to be having you with us here, sir, where you would be speaking to us and taking us on a journey, which we are absolutely excited about. So without any further ado, I would like to... I would not like to skip a moment and just call you on the stage and let the stage be all yours so that we can enjoy what you have to share. Please. All right. Thank you for that introduction, Priyanka. I, I appreciate it. And um, so let me get my slides up and I will go ahead and start this off for you all. Okay. Priyanka, you just can confirm that looks good to you. Wonderful. Um, all right. Yes, well, um, Yes, all uh, sounds good. Yes. All looks good. Great, thank you. Um, well, as much as I wish to be there in person, uh, I hope that, um, that you'll enjoy this presentation that we'll have here for you. I want to thank uh, the Orange City uh, Literature Festival for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here. And I'm here to present what I think is one of the most remarkable newspapers of the 18th century. It's quite, a, quite an incredible story. Um, this newspaper is known as Hickey's Bengal Gazette. That was named after its founder, a man named James Augustus Hickey. It was printed for two short years, from 1780 to 1782, during a time when the British were beginning to conquer India, as I'm sure you all remember from your uh, history lessons in school. I'm also the author of a book on the topic, and if you have any questions about this book or you want to know more about this presentation, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can find me easily online and to shoot me a message um, it's also available in any of your local bookstores. So, discovering the beginnings of India's journalism history, it's a five-year journey, and it, it took me um, from the United States, and this is a beautiful archive called Morgan Library in New York City, uh, Victoria Memorial in Calcutta, to Germany, to the archives in the Halle, many more archives in England, and so forth, and back to India. In total, about five years of research and writing to discover what happened with the beginning of, of journalism history in India and, you know, really piecing together the story and having this presentation for you just to sort of contextualize um, this history and, and also show why it's important and why we should care. And, of course, many sweaty train rides to many archives around the country. I'll give you a bit of a horror show to begin with to sort of show you my, my research was like. So this is the back room of the Madras University Archive in Chennai. I was invited by a professor at the university to go visit, and I did some research here. So you can see all these books, which are um, they're not organized anyway. What I want you to focus on actually is this. These are Bound volumes in newspapers. They're actually invaluable newspapers from the 19th century, and they're quite literally, literally rotting on the shelves. So if you're not familiar with the way archives work, um, this was very surprising to me. And it made the research uh, much more challenging than it would be uh, for other fields. Um, I also had the opportunity to visit local district records. This one is from Tentulia in uh, West Bengal, near the Bangladesh border. All right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, this newspaper. I'll just give you some background information. Uh, you'll notice throughout this presentation that I will have a number of images and a number of slides, but you won't notice any paintings or any images of the editor, of the, the, the founder of the newspaper. And the reason is we don't have them. They don't exist. The closest thing we have is a signature here of the man, James Justice Hickey. So some contextual background, uh, India in 1780 is made up of, it's not unified, it's a number of different princely states. The British are gaining a foothold. Hickey's Bengal Gazette was founded in Calcutta in 1780. 
which was the capital of British Bengal, becoming one of the most important cities for international trade in Asia. And it was the center of the British Empire in India. Specifically, uh, for any of you uh, Bengalis, um, and any of you from Calcutta, it was founded in Radha Bazaar, which was the center of the city. These are the very first pages of the very first newspaper in India. This revolutionized information. Think about it. Previously, everything had to be handwritten in India, and now it can be printed. So what are, what are some things you might notice here? Unlike, say, the Times of India today, you'll notice there are no illustrations. There's no photographs on the first page, right? So technology for these come much later. Remember, we're in 1780. Second, you'll notice there are generally no advertisements. Uh, this will come as a surprise for those of you who do read the Times of India. There are no advertisements on the front page. You'll also notice there are very few headlines. News at this time was more like letters to the editor and opinion all in one. And so the long title for the newspaper is actually Hickey's Bengal Gazette or the Calcutta General Advertiser. It was a gazette of information, so a gazette is a place where information is stored, and also a place for advertisements. You'll also notice something unusual with the letter F. For instance, in the title, Advertiser. This is actually not an F. This is important for later. It's not an F, it's an S. And you can only tell because it has a nub, a little, a little nub on one side. It's called a long S. And about 200 years ago, it fell out of fashion in English writing. So that's an S. All right. Let's explore this newspaper a little bit. Let me show you what's actually inside of it. Here's an example of an, some articles from the front pages. Uh, this one uh, snippet is about war in America. Remember, 1780, American Revolution is going on at the same time. So war, British are fighting Americans. This is war in America coming via a letter, letter from Aleppo in Syria. News has to travel halfway across the world to go from United States, actually 13 colonies, to London, to Syria, to get to India. All right, so here's more local news to India. This is about a storm off the coast in 1779. All right, here's the third and fourth pages of Hickey's Gazette. You'll notice that there's more commentary here. There's some practical information, such as this uh, short snippet about departures, ships coming and going from the city of Calcutta. There's also more advertisements on the third and fourth pages, such as this adver advertisement by the owner of one of Calcutta's libraries, or some exceedingly good claret, which is a type of wine. So he's also a librarian. He sells wine on the side. Eh, everyone loves wine. Okay. All right. There's even some poetry in the newspaper. I love some of the poetry in this. Um, this one's a poem about joy and happiness. Uh, if you have any questions about any of the poetry in the newspaper, I'm happy to talk to you. All right. So the newspaper was run by James Augustus Hickey. He had a staff of assistants. It was printed once a week and it cost one rupee. Let me put that in context for you. One rupee is about the same as three kilograms of rice at that time, um, which means it's fairly expensive, but it's not extremely expensive. Most of the audience would have been those who spoke or read or literate in English, which generally meant the European community in Bengal. It was four pages. It was about 22 by 36 centimeters and circulation was quite low. Um, I don't have specific figures, um, but I can tell you that it was read in coffee houses. Uh, if any of you have been to uh, India coffee houses in uh, Calcutta, you know what I'm talking about. You can share a newspaper there, read it together. The founder, James Augustus Hickey, was an Irishman. And so for the first 40 years in India, all newspapers, you might be surprised to know this, all newspapers in the first 40 years from 1780 to 1820 were run by Europeans. Only later would um, the first Indian owned newspapers become to be printed. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. First, let me piece together the story 
about how this newspaper came to be, how India got its first newspaper. So the editor, James Augustus Hickey, he's orphaned when he's young. He had been apprenticed as a printer um, when he was a teenager. And eventually in 1772, he sails to India from London. The journey would take nine months around the coast of Africa, past Bombay and to Calcutta. In 1776, Hickey goes bankrupt. He had landed in Calcutta. He founded a business. Unfortunately, the business failed when one of his, um, he was a merchant and one of his ships was damaged in the storm. And by 1776, he's in jail for debt. He needs a way to pay for his, his way out of jail. He needs a way to make money. Think about it. Debtor prison at this time in India, actually around the world, debtors, those who are in debt and they're in prison for it, they have to pay for their own food, their own water, and their own rent while in jail, or else they starve. So what Hickey does, he uses money that he um, sent to a friend. He, he asked for a friend for money. He makes types, which are little little things that you use to print with. And he hires carpenters to smuggle a printing press inside of jail. And by 1777, he had founded the first printing press in Calcutta. Actually, um, arguably, besides for Howhead and Wilkins, two others, arguably the first print, one of the first printing presses in the whole of North India. This is some. Uh, this is actually one of the earliest, might actually be the earliest surviving printed document from North India. Um, this is a advertisement for merchant items, goods from, from China, porcelain, silk, and so forth. And it only survives because it was found stitched in the binding of another document, stiffen it, um, found in the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Let me talk to, to you about the newspaper for a little bit. While much of um, the writing in Hickey's Bengal Gazette was by men, probably by men, there are a few excep exceptions that I think that make it, you know, really special. And I think that make it um, hopefully make your time worthwhile with me here. Um, this is an article by an Anglo-Indian woman named Old Nell. It's three columns above the fold. So for those of you who are not journalists, that means it's the most important part of the newspaper. And not only is the most important part above the fold, above where you would fold the newspaper, it is also three columns. It takes up the full breadth of the paper. So, Old Mel, she explains that she is an Anglo-Indian and a greengrocer. She sells vegetables. She's the daughter of an Irish man and an Indian woman, and she says, Though my skin is not so white as your fine ladies, it is as plump and as sleek as the best of them. What is she saying here? She's saying that, you know, she might not be white, but she's still the same as any other person. Um, let, me, let me show you a bit more about what she says. Okay. She writes, you must know, Mr. Hickey, my husband is a gardener, she's talking about her life. I am therefore up at daybreak, plucking my roots, washing them for market. Once I return, generally by nine, but sometimes sooner, eat a hearty breakfast, not a slip slop tea, but a good congee. After which I attend the domestic affairs of our little cottage, whilst my husband is plowing and working the grounds. Our dinner is generally made of wholesome curries or poultry from the yard. Kanji again serves us for supper. Thus we enjoy sound and perfect health, she writes. Here's another article about a fire in Calcutta. The fires were um, a real problem in Bengal, especially in the city of Calcutta, because many of the roofs of the building were made out of thatch, out of straw. And it reads, to the benevolent and powerful, be it known that 15,000 inhabitants of Calcutta are since the late fires in extreme distress. The infants wailing in their mother's bosoms, 
increase the calamity beyond the power of language to describe. Think upon the scene. You patrons of the unfortunate, exert your influence, clothe their nakedness, and give them habitations. So Hickey's using his newspaper as a way to get public support for a cause, as a way to petition the government. And this is one of the general functions of journalism. Um, you speak truth to power, you act as uh, the voice of the people. And so the newspaper is doing it here in this example. All right. So why is Hickey's Bengal Gazette particularly interesting, uh, historically, politically? Well, what it does is it accuses the Governor General, Warren Hastings, um, particularly accuses an aid to, one of Hastings' aides, of soliciting a bribe to, to protect his paper. What man can be safe where such schemes are practiced? The newspaper writes. In response, the government, the East India Company, forbids Hickey from mailing the newspaper through the post office, and it authorizes the search and seizure of anyone's mail suspected of containing his paper. It was found to have disturbed the peace of the settlement, no longer been permitted to be circulated. In response to that, the newspaper began supporting a slogan. A weekly and commercial paper, open to all parties, but influenced by none. Open to all parties, but influenced by none. Okay, I know what you're thinking. It doesn't seem like much. Why, why am I focusing on the slogan? You know, you're talking to me about this ancient newspaper from 200 years ago. Why do we care about this? Why is this important? I'll tell you one of the beauties of, um, of writing a book and doing research and, and really bringing the past to life is that only a couple weeks before this, my book was going to be published, I had a surprising discovery. I was in the museum. It um, was a museum. It was a museum focused entirely for news in the center of Washington, D.C., only five, 10 minutes from the Capitol building. And they have drawers and drawers of old newspapers from the 18th century. I just happened to pull one of these newspapers out of the drawer and I saw the same slogan. There it was, Massachusetts spy, open to all parties, but influenced by none. Virginia Gazette, open to all parties, but influenced by none. I saw this slogan on many American newspapers that were pro-independence, that were pro-revolution against the British. And so for anyone familiar with American politics, that's quite remarkable and familiar with history in general. Um, so think about this. We have during the East India Company rule in Bengal, we have a newspaper proclaiming, proclaiming its editorial independence um, from the British East India Company using the same slogan borrowed from the United States, from the 13 colonies, excuse me. So Hickey appears to have copied the slogan word for word, open to all parties, but influenced by none. And this is a way of saying that it is open to influence, uh, sorry, it is open to um, submissions by all different individuals from, from whatever the spectrum, anyone could write and have their voice heard in the newspaper, but it is not influenced by political powers that be. 1771 in Massachusetts in America, 1781 in India. Hickey's Bengal Gazette begins publishing other articles. This one is, quote, addressed to the inhabitants of Bengal, countrymen and friends. It's a bit ambiguous. Um, I don't know specifically whether Hickey is referring to Europeans or Indians. Maybe that ambigu ambiguity is intentional. And the article writes, government shall consult the welfare of the people and that the people shall obey government on that condition. 
And when that condition is neglected or violated, the people are no longer bound to obey. So it's very much a um, social contract that the newspaper is trying to argue for in India, uh, especially during a time where that uh, that doesn't exist. I mean, uh, the company is, as I'm sure you're aware, effectively despotic in nature. So the newspaper is trying to argue for a social contract. And Governor General Warren Hastings is opposed, obviously, to such a move. Um, and politically, you know, that's one thing. Uh, I'm about to show you something that really got the newspaper in trouble. There's one article that got Warren Hastings' attention. And that is this one. Hickey accuses Hastings of um, launching a wars of aggression, perpetual wars. Hickey also accuses Governor General Warren Hastings of being wild, pusillanimous, sorry, disgraceful and despotic. And he writes, it is reported that the great Mughal, meaning Hastings, is seized with a fit of despondency and political despair. And the faculty, meaning doctors, are of opinion his perennial spring is out of order. This is sort of the 18th century way of saying that Warren Hastings can't get an erection. He's not a man. Um, you can imagine. This does not go over well with Warren Hastings nor the governing council. Lo and behold, Hickey is sued for libel, which is defamation, written defamation. And Hickey is found guilty after a dramatic trial. You know, how do I know some of these facts? How do I know, you know, what's going on sort of behind the scenes? You know, and this is sort of something that historians do, not just me. Um, I'll tell you a little story, and I think this story is quite interesting. Hastings had bribed um, three judges, sorry, there's three judges on the Supreme Court. Hastings had bribed two of them. Here's one of the judges of the Supreme Court of Bengal. His name is Elijah Impey. Hastings had bribed him by giving him a second salary, giving him a second judge position, and other perks that were worth in total a few lakh in rupee, I think maybe three or four lakh, quite a lot at that time. Hastings also bribed the second judge of the Supreme Court, uh, a couple more lakh of rupee. You know, how do I know these things? Well, there's a third judge of the Supreme Court. His name is John Hyde. John Hyde was an honest judge. He refused um, offers to be bribed. And I know this because he kept notebooks written in a secret code. And in the secret code, he was recording his fellow judges accepting the bribery. While I was in Calcutta and I came across these notebooks, um, I found the code and I realized that I didn't know what was in it. In fact, no one did. Um, we didn't know what was in this, uh, this code and we knew it had to be important. So I sent the code to a, um, an expert a professor in cryptology, um, sorry, a professor in ancient shorthand specifically in New Jersey. And she was able, after about two or three years uh, back and forth, she was able to break the code. Um, and here we have it. Hyde writes, before we went into court today, Sir Elijah Impey told me at my house that he had accepted an appointment from Hastings and the appointment had so-and-so money attached to it. So here we have Judge Hyde actually recording in live, in real time, effectively, the bribery of his fellow judges. And he's doing it in code because he's doing this, he's writing these notebooks while he's on the bench of the Supreme Court. And the fellow judges are next to him, so he doesn't want them to know what he's writing. Now, I can, if anyone's curious about these notebooks, I'm, um, Please do email me. Um, it's not the main point of the presentation, but they're fascinating. I'm more than happy to talk about them. All right. So this sounds really kind of sexy, right? And you know, I'm going into these archives, looking at all this cool stuff. All right. it's, it's not really that sexy. Um, I spent many months at the National Library of India reading through these microfilm notebooks. And it was just me scrolling through, scrolling through. 
in a room, mostly by myself. It's not that sexy, but hard work pays off. Um, so that's the process. All right, uh, one more story, um, and I'll sort of begin my, my wrapping up on this. I spent many months at the High Court of Calcutta. This is the High Court. Um, very difficult to gain access as a researcher, but when I was finally approved to, uh, to access the archives in this, um, in this location, I found that there was no catalog. There was really not much organization and I had to make an application, a separate application to see every single document. And while I was in, I was in this uh, high court archive, I found an issue of, of India's first newspaper that existed uh, nowhere else in the world. And I thought it was important to uh, India's history. I thought it was important to um, uh, the history in general, uh, actually. Uh, it was literally crumbling before me. So I wrote three different applications for its preservation and was rejected each time. I managed to sneak some photographs and here's, here's a photograph of the, the issue. And it talks about, you know, um, the day before the Hickey's trials for, for libel, Hickey talks about um, what these trials mean for freedom of the press, uh, what these trials mean uh, for freedom of speech in, in early India. Um, unfortunately, I was rejected. Uh, the, the administration at the high court didn't want this to be documented. I didn't want this to be digitized. All right. Hickey's tried for libel, as you recall, and he remains in jail for the next four years. He keeps printing his newspaper from within jail. I don't know specifically how uh, he did this, um, but he probably had a system with assistance from the outside. And he keeps writing articles defending the freedom of the press like this one. Voice of the people is the voice of God. And he also prints controversial articles like this saying that we have committed a successful forgery on a native of Bengal and we gloried in it, meaning the British have committed forgery, which at that time is a death penalty offense. Meanwhile, a native of Bengal who knew nothing of English laws hanged for a crime that we had triumphed in committing. Um, who was Hickey talking about? A man named Nanda Kumar, actually talking about Clive, sorry, Robert Clive, uh, if you remember from his, his, your history lessons, um, Battle Plassey, uh, very famous British. Anyways, Clive was made a, a peer in England that we committed in Bengal, the same crime that the British judicial system had hung a Indian for. Finally, in March 1782, Hastings had enough. Supreme Court issued an order seizing Hickey's printing press silencing uh, India's first newspaper for good. This was the last, the last issue of the newspaper. Um, Hastings was actually recalled to England to be impeached um, uh, for his uh, alleged crimes in India. There were 22 charges of impeachment covering everything from soliciting bribes, launching wars of aggression. Many of these abuses of power were first documented in a newspaper in Hickey's Bengal Gazette. And the publicity brought by Hickey's newspaper, um, you could argue, uh, did help furnish um, parliamentary investigators with evidence. So we have the newspaper has some use for history because it, it allows, um, you could say, it allows pr pursuit of justice. Uh, Chief Justice Elijah Impey sorry, is also um, recalled to England for impeachment, also acquitted. 1802, Hickey dies um, on a boat to China, to Guangzhou, China. Um, for those who are interested, I'm happy to talk about this more. Uh, I don't know exactly why I was on this boat. All right. So for two short years, Hickey's Bengal Gazette exposed corruption and abuse of power. And sorry about that. Not ready for that slide yet. So why is this important? Why do we care? Well, first, if you think about journalism, you think about the way that um, systems of being apprentices worked, you learn from the masters at the time, you learn from your editors, 
So many of the first printers, uh, many Indians actually, um, such as Ram Mohan Roy, trained with people that Hickey had trained. So they're sort of a family tree of journalism. And that extends all the way to today. Um, second, you know, we think of things like Facebook and Twitter as democratizing uh, and divisive at the same time. You can think of a newspaper sort of as the same thing. Um, so let me talk about the first thing. The first Indian-owned newspaper uh, likely followed in, in Hickey's footsteps. It was called the Bengal Gazette. It was founded in 1818 uh, by a uh, Bengali named Ganga Kishore Bhattacharya. Uh, no copies of this survive. And it was likely uh, named after Hickey's Bengal. So I, I can't prove that, but here's my evidence. You'll notice at the top of Hickey's Bengal Gazette, there is this name circled. This was Hickey's assistant, a man named Paul Ferris. Um, when Hickey died, Ferris collected copies of his newspaper. Paul Ferris was a business associate with Ganga Kishore Bhattacharya. They worked together. All right. So you can think about much of the history and tradition and heritage of journalism in India today, you know, really stemming from these early years and ultimately from India's first newspaper. Second, you know, we can think of things like Facebook and Twitter as democratizing and divisive and you know, polarize society, um, cause many problems. Um, but for many people in the 18th century, newspapers were very similar. It was a way for more voices than were previously heard to have a place to speak, a place where ideas could flourish, um, but also a place where there's a lot of division. Um, and one of the things that ultimately doomed India's first newspaper was that, that ill-timed insult about Warren Hastings. And third, you know, we can think about these early newspapers, particularly Hickey's Bengal Gazette, as a place where traditions of freedom of speech, which you know I know personally, uh, for having lived many years in in Calcutta and in India, are so important to people. Um, I mean, you go to any two Bengalis in the street, and chances are they're probably having an argument about something. Um, so this is a place where you can learn about history uh, because it shows you how people in the past lived, and it shows you how your life, you know, today might not be all that different. So I thank you. Um, I thank you for joining this talk. If you want to learn more about the story, it's in my book. You can find it online or from your local retailer. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your time with me. Thank you. I'm going to take a little time to process all that insight I have gained. Newspapers would never be same again for me. Because now that I've known the story and journey behind it specifically, I really like that part where you told that uh, the judge was writing it in a note and you found it. And then, you know, it came out to be a part of puzzle and it fit. And now you know why it was this. <laughs> it's, it's crazy to even think about it in that perspective. And I really appreciate the fact that you've been able to put this all together and this was completely an insightful session like i said newspaper won't be saying to me ever again so. <laughs> i hope you enjoyed it yeah the those notebooks are very fascinating um mm -hmm. there are there are many beauties uh you know i think people think about history as just being really boring and dusty um it isn't like that always um you know so i encourage you if you have all curiosity try to find my book reading it it's it's really fast really it's really great. It's a great story. It wrote itself. Um, mm -hmm. So that's it. <laughs> I would want this to reach to as many people because I know a lot of people want to know about things and are curious. And what would be better than reading about all of this in this uh, beautiful, beautiful book? Because I personally can warranty that it is going to take you on a ride and it's going to leave you so fascinated about what we have had as a history. So I just want this to reach out to as many people and I wish for you to receive all those compliments and receive all those feedbacks and, and get a lot of people connecting and coming back to you, telling you maybe somebody can tell you something that they know or they can just come and ask yeah. you, right? 
So that that was amazing, uh, Mr. Andrew. It was amazing having you. At the outset, I would like to thank Orange City Literature Fest for making this possible because bringing people from all across the world who know something or a lot, to be very honest, about uh, about things that they have spent their lives on is a privilege to listen. So at the outset, thank you, Orange City Literature Fest, and thank you, Mr. Andrew, for joining us. I wish to hear you again some other time, and I wish <laughs> for the audience to have the privilege as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Beyond.